we can take seriously Lee's request for their trip to Jordan. These trips are not only a challenge physically, spiritually, you're preaching a bunch of times, you're sleeping in different beds that often aren't comfortable. Um, and so, but these trips are also more importantly, very significant on these mission fields. Uh, and so please covenant to pray daily as a family or as an individual for them. And I also ask your prayers as I fly out the next day on Wednesday for West Virginia. And I'll be preaching there for five days. So this is a week of ministry out of our church. And it's an extension of you as a body. So we greatly need and ask your prayers. We're going to turn to Luke 15 as our text. And to save my voice, I've asked Matthew Krogstad if he'll in a moment stand after everyone finds Luke 15. Matthew's going to read the chapter for us. Luke chapter 15. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all drawing near to hear him. And the Pharisees and the scribes grumbled, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. So he told them this parable. What man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he has lost one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the open country and go after the one that is lost until he finds it? And when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulder, rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and his neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep that was lost. Just so, I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over ninety-nine righteous persons who need no repentance. Or what woman, having ten silver coins, if she loses one coin, does not light a lamp and sweep the house and seek diligently until she finds it. And when she has found it, she calls together her friends and neighbors, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the coin that I had lost. Just so, I tell you, there is joy before the angels of God over one sinner who repents. And he said, There was a man who had two sons, And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of property that is coming to me. And he divided his property between them. Not many days later, the younger son gathered all he had and took a journey into a far country. And there he squandered his property in reckless living. And when he had spent everything, a severe famine arose in that country and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country who sent him into his fields to feed pigs. And he was longing to be fed with the pods that the pigs ate, and no, no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread, but I perish here with hunger? I will arise and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, bring quickly the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet and bring the fattened calf and kill it and let us eat and celebrate. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found and they began to celebrate. Now his older son was in the field, and as he came and drew near to the house, he heard music and dancing, and he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And he said to him, your brother has come, and your father has killed the fattened calf, because he has received him back safe and sound. But he was angry and refused to go in. His father came out and entreated him. 
But he answered his father, Look, these many years I have served you, and I never disobeyed your command, yet you never gave me a young goat that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came, who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fattened calf for him. And he said to him, Son, you are always with me, and all that is mine is yours. It was fitting to celebrate and be glad, for this your brother was dead and is alive. He was lost and is found. Again, pray with me. Father, this is your word. So, again, we come needing you more than anything else to speak and to hear and receive the truth of your word. So it's to you we look and our good and gracious Loving God, it's you that we call upon to give the blessing of your spirit upon the ministry of the truth for your people, for your glory, and for our good. We thank you in the name of our Savior. Amen. Luke 15 is about the the, the love and joy of God over one sinner that ever repents. The love and the joy of God over even one sinful person that truly repents. Now think before we even get into this, um, we should think about the context of why Jesus had to give this parable as a response because of the attitudes of the Pharisees. You know, at this time in Jerusalem, the temple, temple Judaism was dead. It was a dead ritual. And the truth was no longer really believed, especially about the God of Israel. Of course, Messiah in their minds was in the future. And some there were some among Israel that were truly waiting, Simeon in the temple, for instance. But for the most part, it was nominal dead Judaism. And therefore, there was... There wasn't even a clear Trinitarian view of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit clearly manifested yet. The Holy Spirit was in the, in the Old Testament scriptures, of course, but it was cloudy and it was vague. And so for the Jew in Jesus' time in the temple, especially the, the leaders, the scribes and Pharisees and the rabbis, the view of God was just Jehovah, Yahweh, Holy separate from sinners, and their attitude towards sinners reflected their view of Jehovah's attitude towards sinners. And that's what always is coming out in opposition to the Lord Jesus Christ. So Jesus gives this parable in response to their wrong view of God, really, and obviously their wrong view toward him, whom they don't know yet fully, is Messiah. It's one parable, the whole chapter really, in three parts. Part one, a lost sheep, verses three through seven. Part two, a lost coin, verses eight through ten. And part three, a lost son, the longest part, verses 11 through 32. Three stories, one parable with one point. So Jesus gives it as a response because there's murmuring going on. ESV reads grumbling. So who's murmuring and grumbling? The same ones as always. The religious leaders. The denominational leaders. The scribes and the Pharisees. Because that's what they do. Like a broken record. They murmur. They complain. They criticize. They nitpick. They They falsely judge and they find fault and pick away at anything that doesn't toe the line with with their traditional laws and rules. What are they murmuring here about? That this man, this, this teacher who's influencing so many already is being friendly to sinners. Actually friendly to sinners. He's always with sinful people. 
tax collectors, harlots, lepers, demonized dirty men, the outcasts of society, beggars, the lowest of the low. And not only is he, is he friendly with them, he's actually attracted to them. And they're attracted to him. They, they crowd around anytime they find out where he is. He's warm toward them. He's welcoming toward them. He touches them. He lets them touch him. So this was always the offense. Along with, of course, he's always breaking the Sabbath. Right? Or at least the Sabbath rules. The Sabbath traditions. A few of the 613 laws that, that the rabbis and scribes had, had accumulated, which were tradition, not Mosaic law. So they're always coming on to Jesus. Touching the leper. Well, that's illegal. How dare he do that? How could he do that? How can he be so welcoming to those dirt bags and those filthy people and those Gentile dogs who are not like us? Jehovah's holy and we're holy, but not them. That's the Pharisees' attitude. Major condescension. That's the problem. Jesus, Jesus isn't condescending toward the dirty and the scoundrels and the scumbags. They're murmuring because this man actually receives sinners. And you go back to the beginning of the chapter, that's the reason they were murmuring. The tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around to hear Jesus. But they start muttering because of that. This man, look, he welcomes sinners. Murmuring. So all of Jesus' words in Luke 15 are in response to this wrong view they have. And what a response it is. It's a devastating condemnation of their wrong view of God and of God's true disposition and heart towards sinful people. Their views of God and how he relates to man were so bad and so perverted that very few in Israel at that day had any light about the true God anymore. The light was almost gone out in true understanding. So the fact that Jesus gives this parable as a response to how he is towards sinners tells us a very important thing about how we interpret Luke 15. The parable is not about the prodigal son, really. It's about the prodigal son's father who does receive sinners and who does eat with them and welcomes them warmly. It's a parable about the father specifically, which is going to, in a moment, we're going to get into, that's going to be my, actually my first simple point. The parable is about Jesus correcting their wrong views of what God is truly like. Because this parable so amazingly reveals that contrary to God being repulsed by sinful people, he is actually attracted to sinful people because of their need. That the Father has a loving heart for sinners. He's not avoiding them. He moves toward them in compassion. His door is always open. His gate on the farm is, is always unlocked so sinners can get back home where they belong to the Father in their faraway journey in a far country where they are. So first, let's observe the specific things that are lost in the parable. First, verses Verse uh, 4 through 11, you have, well, not 4 through 11, beginning with verse 4, you have the lost sheep. It's one out of a hundred sheep that is lost. Now, that's only 1%, a 1% loss. Not much at all, 1%. No big deal, right? But to this man, one sheep is one sheep. And being a caring, caring shepherd, he cares about the lost one. So he goes after the one and he finds it. 
and he carries it home, Scripture says, with joy. And even his friends, he has them to celebrate with him. One sheep out of a hundred. But then the number changes. The second picture, verse 8, it's a lost coin. It's a woman who has ten coins, and she loses one. That's a 10% loss. That's much bigger. And like a good housewife, she does a, a full search of the house. She can find it, unlike men who can't find things that wives can find. She searches everywhere, and she finds the lost coin. She finds it. And she, too, has joy with her friends because that which was lost is found. And then the number changes again. You have one sheep out of a hundred, one coin out of ten, but the value now goes even higher. And it's something much more valuable that's lost now. Not a sheep, not a coin, but it's a, a son. A man has two sons, verse 11 says. Not a hundred, not ten, two sons. So this is not an animal or, or money. This is a human being. You know, it's one thing if you lose your dog. The dog runs off. Or you lose a hundred dollar bill. It's another thing altogether if a child is lost, right? A family member. And here a human soul that's created in God's image is the one that's lost. It's one son of a loving father. A lost son. And the father's going to say later, this my son, this my son. So why is Jesus telling the story this way? One sheep out of a hundred is not a big loss. But the man wanted it back. One coin out of ten is a real loss, but she wanted it back. And the father's love wants the lost son back because of how much more value is one son than all the sheep and money in the world. Now it also may be true that Jesus chooses this threefold parable to reach the consciences of some of these critics if any of them still have a conscience because after all who wouldn't want to find their lost sheep or their lost money or their lost child it's a very wise and perfect parable and the the three lost things in the order of their importance drives home the dr drama and the warmth of this parable that all three are recovered with joy and it shows us the heart of God unlike the Pharisees heart the heart of God toward that which is lost. Three simple points this morning. Number one, the parable is primarily about the father. Number two, it's about the son's repentance toward the father. And number three, it's about the joy of the father in the son's return. Number one, the father. Number two, the son's repentance. And number three, the joy. Number one, the parable is primarily about the Father. Now, you know, for years, I viewed this chapter and this parable the way so many still do. Luke 15 is about what? The, the parable of the prodigal son. And that's the way it's viewed. But as you read the chapter closely, you discover that it's the Father that stands out more than anyone in the, in the parable. The older brother is only mentioned briefly at the end, representing who? The murmuring ones. And the son who runs off and wastes his life for a period of time is mentioned seven times. But the father is mentioned twice as much. Fourteen times Jesus refers to the father in the story. So the father here has the leading role, and the son only is a supporting actor. It's, the parable is really about the dad, the one who's good, who's home, and has only been good to both sons, and the son departs. And so the parable unfolds about the father. 
So if Luke 15 is truly about the Father forgiving and welcoming sinners, there's something very important to notice. Unlike the wrong view displayed by the Pharisees about God, Jesus' emphasis here is this. There's not one negative word or action on the part of the Father in the parable toward the Son. In Luke 15, the Pharisees are only negative and condemning towards sinners, but Jesus here shows this Father to be just the opposite. Unlike the Pharisees, this Father, everything he feels and does toward his Son is winsome and tender and kind and redeeming and welcoming and loving. Isn't that how the Bible presents the gospel. We see throughout verses 20 through 32 how this father is toward this foolish boy. He sees him way down the road. He runs to him. He kisses him. He welcomes him. He throws a party all because he's happy and joyful and glad that he's home. This is telling the Pharisees what God is really like towards sinful people. And in doing so, Jesus clearly presents the right view of God here to them about what a true father is like. This is about the father and what God is like toward the lost one. You know, if... If, if a person who's not a Christian, if their view of God ever get, becomes clear and right, and they view him for what he's truly like and how he truly is, they will melt and they will want to run home. So the parable is about the Father and what God is truly like. Then secondly, the parable is about the son's repentance toward the father. The son's repentance toward the father. There's probably no better picture of repentance found anywhere than in verses 17 through 19. Let's read them again. This is the greatest picture, I believe, of repentance in the New Testament. Look at it with me again. Let it sink in. When he came to his senses, what does that mean? When he came to himself, when suddenly he saw clearly what he was really like and where he was in the bad condition, and he saw reality for the first time, when he came to his senses, verse 19 says, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have food to spare, and here I am. I'm starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Just make me like one of your hired servants. That's repentance. That's the heart of a repentant, lost one toward God. And that son's heart was repentant here toward his father. Look how much he mentions the father here in verses 17 through 19. How do we know the son's repentance is genuine and real? Because it's toward the one he sinned against. Repentance is not being sorry that you're in the pig pen. Repentance is not being sad that things are bad for you now. Repentance is not just being grieved over the consequences. Repentance is not because you don't have enough or you've lost all your friends. Repentance is toward the Father. Remember Paul put it this way, Repentance toward God and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. That's repentance. 
And the language here shows that. The son's words. Verse 17. How many of my father's workers have enough? He's thinking, you know, my father was actually good. Look what I had. My father is so good. My father's workers, they're all treated so well. They have all that they need. My father is good. Verse 18. I'm going to rise and I'm going to go where? I'm going to go to my father. And I'm going to say, my father. Verse 20. And he arose and came to his father. Verse 21. Father, I've sinned. Father, I have sinned. It reminds us of Psalm 51. Against you and you only, O God, have I sinned and done this evil in your sight. So from verses 17 through 24, the father-son relationship is mentioned 11 times. And the son's repentance is toward his father because he sees the grievous break that he's had with his father who has loved him all along. So verse 20, you see the son here returning to the father. It says, and when he was a long way off, his father saw him coming. And what does the father do? The father runs. The father sees him a long ways off, way down the road leading up to the farm. He sees him. And the father's heart is filled with compassion. And it's like his heart is ripped open with love for the boy, this foolish boy who's hurt the family, who's embarrassed the family, who's done damage to the family reputation. This boy now so thin, so probably dirty, weak and undernourished in filthy rags, perhaps dried pig dirt on his arms. Shame and humility on his face. But here he comes. Coming home just as he is. Just like he is. You know, there's no other way to come. Than just as you are. Jeff Thomas says about this boy. Quote, The glimpse of that distant and lost boy standing and looking at the farmhouse was all the father could take. The door had been unlocked the whole time. And the old man's legs are now running toward the boy, even if it's painful. He reaches him. Words can't be spoken at first because of the sobs. As dad's tears wet the dirty boy's cheeks, he kisses him as he used to when he was young. And he whispers, I'll never let you go again. I'll never let you go again. End quote. This shows us that when one comes repentant to the Father, that's how God feels about welcoming and eating with sinners. That's how He feels. That's God's response. Grace comes and runs and meets the sinner in repentance and embraces him in the arms of love and draws him in. So the parable is about the father, number one. And number two, it's about the repentance of the son toward the father. Saying sinners aren't rejected when they come. They are welcomed with loving arms. And number three, the parable is about the joy of the father in the son's return. The joy of the father in the son's return. And I think verses 20 and 20 through 24 is the greatest picture of reconciliation and conversion in all the New Testament. 20 through 24, I believe, is the greatest picture of reconciliation and conversion in the New Testament. Luke 15 is the most joyful chapter in the, in the Bible. The angels are rejoicing. And when the son comes walking to the house with the father, all work stopped on the farm. 
Because what does the father say? The father said to his servants, quick. So suddenly the servants, the father calls the servants, says, okay, look, work stopped for the day. Everybody has the day off. Here's what we're going to do. That, that fat calf, you go barbecue it and tell the cook in the, in the house to whip up some baked beans, coleslaw, and, and tell that servant to, to put the white tablecloths on the table and go get the wine and the lemonade and go tell those two servants who can play the fiddle, go tune them up, tell them to be ready because we're going to have a dinner party and dancing. That's what we're going to do. A festive dance with dinner. This reflects heavenly joy, redeeming joy, fatherly joy, no murmuring, only joy. No negativity, no holding the son of discipline. Well, I don't know if he's truly repented. Time will tell. We'll see. No, it's joy that he's just home. It's joy that he's just home. And this theme of joy runs from verse 5 through 32 as a thread through the entire chapter. This is God's kingdom response to the lost one coming home. Joy and rejoicing and happiness. I hope we applaud more when someone says, I've been saved, than we applaud for a new baby. Both of them need applause. But there's joy in the presence of God among the angels when one sinner repents. Maybe they applaud when a baby's born too. I don't know. But we know what they do when someone is saved, when one comes home to the loving arms, and so it's all joy. Just, just track with me at the joy. Verse 5, the man lays the sheep on his sh shoulder rejoicing. Verse 6, friends come rejoice with me. Verses 7 through 10, there's joy in heaven over one sinner. One lost coin found, rejoice with me. Joy in the presence of the angels over one. Verse 23 and 24, let's eat and be merry, and they began to rejoice. 25, there's music and dancing. 32, it's right to rejoice and be glad. Isn't it clear what Jesus is trying these Pharisees to get them to see? This is God's heart of joy and welcoming love for any sinful one to come and be reconciled. Now think of this. When Jesus healed the man by the pool, and it made the Pharisees angry. Do you think when the man stood up and he was well, Jesus had a twinkle in his eye and joy in his heart? He would have. When he raises the dead, when he heals the blind and the lame, when he, when he forgives the harlot, Jesus, the man, Jesus, would have had joy flowing in his heart because this is what the Son of Man came to do, to seek and to save that which is lost. The joy of God. This is the gospel contrary to the anti-gospel of the Pharisees. They're angry. Why? Because they're blind. They're blind to the way God truly is. They're blind to what God is truly like. They're blind to the warmth and tenderness of Jehovah's love for the worst of sinners. To these Jews, Jesus is showing the, how the Messiah feels about sinners right in front of him. That God wants to save them, not condemn them. That his lo love flows toward them and is for them in their current condition. You know, Hosea says some of the most powerful things in all the Bible about the love of God towards sinful people. There in Hosea, God says, Israel, how can I give you up to sin and death? How can I do this? My heart is stirred within me, and my compassion grows warm within me. No, I will not execute my fierce, uh, my fierce anger, but I will heal their backslidings, and I will love them freely. That is Luke 15. That's what Jesus would love for these Pharisees to see. 
the extravagant love of God for the sinners of Jerusalem and for us and for you as an individual, for you if you're yet lost and in a far off place from God. The love of God for one soul, for one lost child. Christ's love is a seeking and an active love. Like the shepherd going after the one sheep. Like the woman staying at it till she gets her one coin back. The Pharisees were mad when they saw the Savior loving sinners while Jesus is displaying the love of God right in front of their eyes for such sinners. That's what is being taught here. Now in closing, I want us to apply this in some real ways to us in a couple of brief thoughts. Luke 15, among other things, gives us two big realities about what the kingdom of God is like and what the gospel is like. First, what I would call gospel longings. Gospel longings. Temple Judaism didn't believe that Jehovah had gospel longings. They didn't believe the good news. It was dead, dead tradition and ritual with no heart. No divine longings towards sinners. No gospel longings, if you will. No longings of the triune God for lost men and women to be reconciled to the Father. So here's the loving call of the Savior, not the condemning voice of the rabbis. The seeking and saving of those he came to save. The Father's longing voice, always calling. There's forgiveness here. There's healing here. There's acceptance here. There's love here. Come, eat and drink. Come and feast. Come and be forgiven. Come home and wander no longer. Come and welcome to the loving Jesus. The longing of divine love radiates through this parable. And that longing love has reached every one of us that are believers. And that longing love that's in our hearts should have a longing for those lost around us to be reached. Gospel longings from the heart of God have reached us. And those gospel longings need to go out of our heart for those still in the pig pen. Gospel longings. Second, kingdom joy. What did Paul say? The kingdom of God is not what? Meat and drink. But it's what? It's righteousness. It's peace. And it's joy in the Holy Spirit. Kingdom joy. That's what comes out here. When one person is saved, as someone said, it's shouting and dancing time in heaven. There's joy in heaven when one sinner repents. And it's pictured here. The sheep found, the coin found, they rejoice. The sons come home. It's only a time to rejoice. The first song on the playlist at the party might have been celebrate good times. Come on. Who knows? This boy welcomed home. His past is forgotten. Oh, not by the older brother, but by those who count. His past is forgotten cleaned up because the kingdom of God is righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. Now, for some of you who aren't Christians yet, you've observed something here in our church. Why are the Christians here at Providence Chapel who are walking with Christ, why do you see in their lives authenticity, why do you observe in their lives that they are authentic, that they are loving, and that they're joyful? And why don't you have it? You see authenticity. You see reality. You see he or she is real. 
they exemplify the joy of Christ. They exemplify the love of God toward others. They walk it, they talk it, they live it. Why do you see that? Because they, the believers you observe, have kingdom joy in Christ that's real. And you know in your heart you don't have it. You're a stranger to it. But here, in this kingdom life, the great mark is newness, and the great mark is, is joy, the joy of the Father celebrated in the family. Newness of life and true joyful happiness because in the gospel, in the good news that one has come home, that's wonderful news because there's only acceptance there. There's only now Father's unconditional love. That's the heart of Christ in the parable. God is not withdrawn from sinners. Instead, he seeks them out and he saves them because he wants them. He draws near to them in tender love to receive them home because of the value of one soul. If you're not a Christian today, your soul, your soul individually is valuable to God. He made you. He created you for His glory. He wants you. What's one sheep worth? It's worth it to the owner of the sheep, right? What's one coin worth? It's worth it to the owner of the coin. What's one eternal soul worth? It's worth it to the owner. What's your soul worth? If you're not a believer, what is your soul worth? I'll tell you what it's worth. It's worth it to your owner. The one sheep was worth it to the shepherd, and the one coin was worth it to the woman, and the one son was worth it to the father. So do you value your own soul what good is it, is it if anyone gains the whole world and loses their soul the prodigal son one day had a wake up moment scripture says he came to himself he came to his senses he was there miserable dirty hungry starving and he had a wake up moment he had right thinking suddenly come to him and he said to himself, look at me. What a miserable wretch I am. What have I done? How foolish have I been? How stupid could I have been? How blind have I been? What do I have to gain if I stay here? What, a, what if I went home? Well, that's scary. What? What would my brother think? What would the servants think? What do, I, what do I have to gain if I go home? I don't know, but I know this. There's nothing for me here except misery and starvation. Here's what I'll do. And here's where repentance started. When the right thinking comes, the clarity of mind comes, repentance starts here. He says, here's what I'll do. I will arise and go to my father. What else is he waiting for? Nothing. So it says he got up and he went home. He arose and he went home. Lost one here this morning. Young man, young lady. What are you waiting for if you're still in a far country? And you know in your heart, if you're thinking rightly, if you, if you come to your senses at all, you know... Being there is not with the Father. You know you're not reconciled to the Father. You know you're in a far country spiritually. What are you waiting for? If you are a lost one, far from the Father, and in your heart you're dirty, you're guilty, you're scarred, and you're scared, this morning can you view God more clearly 
by hearing the words of your Savior? Can you see his love for you more clearly? Can you finally come to your senses and get up from where you are and go to him? The son in the pig pen came to himself and he viewed himself rightly for the first time, but just as important, his view of his father back home changed. He looked and he said, my father, he's always been good and kind. Maybe he'll be that way to me, so I'll go home. So what did he do? He got up and went. He left where he was and he went. That is repentance toward God. Just your heart leaving from where you've been and saying, I'm going to Christ. I'm going to believe on him. I'm not staying where I am. I'm going to get up and go to Christ. If God is truly good, if the Father is like this that Jesus portrays, if Christ is truly welcoming if a loving Father is there, if the gospel is this wonderful, if the love of God is this free, if He will receive you and accept you in loving embrace, then what will you do? What will you do today? Father, I've sinned. Father, I have sinned. That's the starting place. Father, I've sinned. What a mess I am. How needy I am. How dirty I am. I'm, I am what I am now because of my sin. Father, I've sinned. But Jesus, I'm coming to you now. Here I am with nothing but my sin in my heart. I'm coming. I will believe. I do believe that you died for me. Out of my bondage, my sorrow, my shame. Jesus, I come. Jesus, I come. Jesus, I come to you. Do you think the prodigal son was glad that he went home? You'll be glad if you'll get up from where you are in your neutrality, in your resistance, in your stubbornness, in your staying far off. If you'll get up and leave that and come. All that you've got waiting for you is a reception of forgiveness and newness and love. Just come with nothing. Come with nothing. Come dirty. Come messed up. Come freely. Just come with nothing to freely receive everything from such a father as this and believe the love God has for you. Let's pray. I want us just to wait before the Lord in these moments. Let's just have some quiet to just be before God. And let the truth that He's made real to you. Sink in. Father, we thank you for the truth of the greatness of a loving God, the greatness of a Father's love. We're so thankful that the gospel tells us that you receive and welcome and eat with sinners. The, the love of God welcomes anyone home who will come, get up, and come. So bless your word this day to our hearts and to the salvation 
of individuals. And Lord, as believers, make us channels of this loving, longing compassion, channels of your, your truth and your love to others. We bless you this day, Father, for your word. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, we pray. Amen.